<clears throat> Siddharth, do you want me to just start? Um, okay, so uh, hi, hello everyone again. I hope everyone had a nice break, probably not long enough. Um, I'm Sunila Kale, I think I've met almost everyone. I thought I would start by first, of course, thanking Siddharth for this invitation. It's been a really great chance to meet a whole new collection of colleagues and, uh, and to learn something about accountability and legitimacy, which is, you know, these are fields that I don't <clears throat> engage with. Um, and I thought I would also just tell you a little bit about my previous work, which will probably provide a better indication of why Siddharth invited me to this than the talk title and the talk that I'll give. Um, I started out, my first set of projects was on energy politics in India. And um, in some ways, I, uh, I, I backed into history. Um, I think, Timothy, uh, you talked about um, walking into the present as a historian. And uh, I was a political scientist who kind of had to walk back into history because the project that I set out to do for my doctoral research was really very similar to Danielle's project in China. And that was a project to understand how market reforms were playing out in India in a really uneven way. Um, there was a set of mandates from coming from New Delhi about how the electric uh, system should be restructured and privatized and deregulated. And that was taking place across Indian states in really different ways. So that project that I set out to do was to try to account for that unevenness. And as I set out to do that, what I realized is that that unevenness was actually a product of um, very distinct uh, patterns that were historical in nature about the development of these um, subnational or state level electric grids in India. So I was forced to kind of do the work of the historian. Um, also because um, when I started this research two decades ago, that field of energy studies was really a North American and European one and I couldn't find energy, a, a good energy history of India. So um, in that sense, I backed myself into that. Uh, the second project I did also focused on energy politics, and that was really more um, targeted at the contemporary period. And that's uh, actually how I came to know Siddharth. This was a collaborative uh, project that looked at 15 states in India and electricity governance. Why it is that uh, levels of access remained really low in some states? Why it is that renewable targets were being met in some states and not others? Right? It was, a, it was an attempt to have a, to, to develop a comparative framework about electricity governance in India by bringing together a team of researchers. So Liz Chatterjee, who was mentioned a few times, was a part of that project, and uh, Siddharth um, did research in two Western Indian states, Rajasthan and Gujarat. So um, both of those two projects were squarely focused on energy politics, and I didn't use the language of accountability, but I think I could have. I think I could sort of... Um, reverse engineer my thinking on energy politics as it developed in those projects and probably use this framework of accountability. Since then, I've gone on to actually enter fields that a few other uh, few others uh, in the room today have, have kind of started with, which, were, which is land politics. Um, so my current work, one set of current research is on uh, land politics around mine, in mining areas in eastern India. Um, and specifically looking at how corporate social responsibility is becoming this new mechanism or mo modality for, for um, corporations to take care of or deal with or mediate however, whatever kind of pessimistic language you want to use, uh, the aspirations of local communities. So that's um, one project that I'm doing. What I'm going to present today is actually um, a project that I did for a volume on subnational comparative politics. So I'll tell you about, a bit about that in a second. Um, the way I think that this, the presentation I'll make today contributes to the discussion we're having is that I try to, what I, what I hope will come out of it um, is a consideration of what kinds of mechanisms enable accountability. So there's been a lot of discussion about what we mean by accountability. Um, and I guess I'm gonna leave that aside and presume for a moment that we know what we mean by accountability and actually think about the kinds of mechanisms that facilitate it. Um, in the last talk, we heard that deliberate, you know, deliberation or deliberative democracy or deliberative methods are one mechanism of achieving that. And those, uh, those operate unevenly in different parts of the world and, um, and certainly in India, deliberative methods or deliberative fora are exclusionary in their nature. 
So what I'll propose is another way to think about mechanisms of accountability. So how is it enacted or achieved? achieved? What are the practices that facilitate it? Um, what actors or agents are necessary in these processes? Um, and I'll think about these questions in, the sp in a specific empirical context, which is governance of forests in India. Um, okay, so the governance of forest resources plays a really pivotal role in climate change, and I think this is not a point that I need to belabor in this room. Um, and energy, any discussion of energy transitions uh, towards sustainable futures has to include a discussion of forests, and we heard a bit about that in uh, Christian's talk yesterday as well. Um, so very, very briefly, because as I said, this is, I think, well understood in this context, uh, the context of this room. Um, forest resources contribute substantially to carbon emissions uh, through deforestation, forest degradation, and on the positive side, they may mitigate some of the effects of uh, increasing carbon in the atmosphere. Um, although I know the science around this is, is actually a, a little bit more complex than that simple phrasing. Um, I still think, though, that forest governance has to play a role in how we think about energy transitions, um, and especially when we think about energy transitions in the context of questions of social justice or equality. So there's a social dimension to the discussion of forest governance that holds equally for India and for many parts of the world, and that's the relationship between forest resources, forest governance, and the political and social marginalization of communities that have historically relied on forests and forest pro you know, products for their livelihoods, uh, habitations. So the most recent UN estimates put the, the percentage of people who are forest dependent in some way at about 25%. And of course, that, you know, um, that's an, a global average, and that figure is much higher in, in some parts of the world than others. Um, so forest governance then becomes really crucial to considerations not then only of, of uh, climate change, but also of social justice or social equity. Uh, in the Indian context, the governance or the importance of forest is sociologically specific. So here's, a, here's just to give you a sense of how forest cover is, um, uh, you know, varies across the states of India. So it's sociologically specific in that if it, it affects people coded by the Indian state as indigenous or adivasi, adivasi meaning original inhabitants, um, and who are in Indian constitutional language uh, denoted a scheduled tribe, right? A term used to describe communities that are enum enumerated by the state as such. The spread and character of forests is not uneven across India, so governance requires attention to scale, which is something I know that Siddharth is concerned with in this, uh, in this volume and in this uh, enterprise to think about um, accountability. So in India, as elsewhere, there are numerous threats to forest resources, from replacing complex forest systems with single species plantation forests, the destruction of forests for livestock grazing and agriculture, and threats from wildfires, among other factors. Uh, in India, forest cover, as in many parts of the world, is also under threat from expansion of mining uh, and what various state agencies call developmental activities, which includes everything from the building and construction of small and large-scale irrigation works, road and other infrastructure construction, and private and public manufacturing and commercial activities. Uh, the other thing to note about forest regions in India is their close overlap with districts that have high concentrations of Adivasi communities, right? The scheduled tribe or ST communities as the Indian state denotes them. Um, I, I don't have a map showing the, the variation, uh, or I don't have a map to put alongside this right now showing the variation of STs, but there is a relationship between states with high levels of forest cover and states that have high concentrations of Adivasi communities. Um, the historian Ramachandra Guha wrote on the 60th anniversary of Indian independence that Adivasi communities, and this is his quote, have uh, gained the least and lost the most from six decades of uh, democracy and development in India. And that comment is no less true now that India has crossed the 70 year mark since independence. Adivasi communities have really been left out of most, most measures of progress. Um, this is not without some, at least on paper, uh, legislation and policies that, are attempt, you know, that have attempted to provide some redress to this. So um, in, since independence in 1947, the central government has enacted a range of policy measures to try and protect and advance the rights of STs or scheduled tribes. 
For instance, the Constitution, and probably this is the best known, um, the Constitution reserves seats for scheduled tribes in federal and state elected, elected bodies, as well as educational institutions. And for many decades, the central government has earmarked various kinds of funds to distribute to state governments, specifically for ST welfare and development. Right, so there's a whole host of welfare expenditures that are targeted, to, targeted towards ST populations. Right, so despite the existence of all of these measures, um, it's undeniably true that welfare of Adivasi communities continues to lag tremendously behind you know, the kinds of economic, socioeconomic uh, advances that you can see in metrics uh, of other, other populations. Um, most recently, the Forest Rights Act, which was passed in 2006, um, aims to protect property and customary rights of indigenous communities to forest lands. So despite these efforts, which include welfare as well as rights-based measures, um, indigenous communities on the whole have been left out of most political and economic advances in the post-colonial Indian state. So the work that I'll present, present today comes from an essay that I co-authored with a colleague of mine at Tufts University in Boston, Nima Mazahari. Uh, and that is um, an essay that's, uh, as I said, part of a, a volume that is focused on subnational comparative methods. So I should say at the outset this, that the, the main intervention that we make in this essay is really a methodological one. It's trying to make the case to uh, a subfield of the American political science establishment, that's comparative politics, which has, for you know, uh, the last many decades, been really focused on cross-national comparison as the, the sort of the gold standard of comparative politics. So we try to make the case in, in our essay and in really the larger collection of essays that subnational comparison is a much more um, flexible and useful tool to actually understand what might explain different, you know, variation in causal processes of, of, of various types. So the essays have um, pieces looking at all parts of the world and really a, a range of different sectoral or uh, topical issues. Um, so that methodological discussion won't be quite as relevant for this discussion here. So uh, you know, I'm happy to come back to that in the discussion that follows, but I won't belabor that here. Um, although we do consider the scale, the importance of scale, and we make the case for the importance of sensitivity to scale in analyzing topics that are germane to the energy transition. Okay, so to understand forest governance, including the implementation of the Forest Rights Act, uh, requires that you adopt a subnational perspective, right? This was a piece of legislation that was passed by the government of uh, India, the, the government based in Delhi, uh, meant to apply equally across states in India, and yet the implementation of this policy, as with most policy in the social domain uh, falls to the state governments. And state governments in India have tremendous variation in the kinds of capacity that they have to undertake implementation of laws. They have uh, a great deal of variation in terms of their, um, uh, you know, the, the wealth uh, that displays itself in bureaucratic function, as well as the kinds of needs that populations um, present to the state. Um, so there's a usefulness in looking at uh, a state level analysis, or there's a, it's a requirement, right? And um, Stephen, you you did some of this work in your uh, cross national, so sorry, your subnational analysis of the Forest Rights Act. So where we depart a bit from from what you did in that piece is uh, to focus in this essay really on four a set of four states. Uh, and these are the states of Jharkhand and Chhattisgarh, uh, and Madhya Pradesh and Odisha. Um, and I would argue that if you're really, if you're going to compare outcomes across states, then within within a country as diverse as India, then you need to have a little bit a little bit of sensitivity to what your what the basis of your comparison is. So it doesn't necessarily make sense to to compare implementation of Forest Rights Act in uh, the wealthy state of Maharashtra to a much poorer state, which has a very different kind of state capacity. So what we've done here in this piece is isolate uh, our comparison to four states. And these four states are useful for us because they share a number of, uh, a number of traits in common. So that is, they are all low to middle income states, right? Uh, a few of them were part of that acronym BIMARU, who, which is, will be familiar to scholars of India, right? It's standing kind of, in, in, it's, a, it's a word that in Hindi means sick or ill, and it was a, an acronym used to denote this group of states in the middle of the country that 
were, you know, had poor measures on a whole range of socioeconomic, um, a whole range of socioeconomic, socioeconomic measures. So they are low income states, they tend to have low levels of literacy, they tend to have fairly poor health outcomes. And um, the work of uh, the economist Kunal Sen and his colleagues has demonstrated that they all have fairly limited state capacity. And they have a nice index measure that they've developed uh, to, to, um, to measure bureaucratic or state capacity. Uh, and these four states kind of fit within the, the same general range. Right? So we're comparing a group of states that are very similar in a number of different ways. They differ, however, in, in a couple of really sharp ways. And uh, I mentioned just now that Jharkhand and Chhattisgarh were formed in 2000 out of the states of Bihar and Madhya Pradesh. And that fact of state formation in 2000 is really, becomes really useful for us in this analysis because it allows us to compare one state, Jharkhand, that was explicitly formed on the basis of a tribal identity, right? It was, it was formed as a tribal homeland. Um, Madhya Pradesh and Odessa ha don't have this as a part of their uh, state formation history, right? So there's no, they have roughly similar percentages of Adivasi communities within their state populations, but there's no privileging of an Adivasi identity within the, the, the way the state understands itself. Um, and in fact, Odessa's uh, politics have tended to be nominated since independence by a fairly upper caste, upper class urban elite, and that fact has remained pretty consistent for 70 years. Uh, Madhya Pradesh, uh, the politics in Madhya Pradesh have lots of different features, but one of them is the con continuing relevance of princely or feudatory social relations. And those princely or feudatory social relations are actually because those princely states in, some, in many instances are mapped onto electoral constitu constituencies in the state of Madhya Pradesh. There is a way in which those social relations actually continue to dominate political uh, identities in the state. OK. Um, so this fact of variation in state formation allows us to uh, use a comparison of these four states to inter interrogate some of the literature in political science, primarily, on the relationship between welfare effects or welfare expenditures and social identity or social the, 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 social, the character of the state, the social character of the state. OK, so what do I mean by that? Okay, so there's a large body of literature in social science that aims to understand why the provision of public goods and services varies so, dramati so dramatically from one place to the next. So one prominent set of arguments focuses on the role played by so social heterogeneity in producing variation in public goods provision. So for example, based on subnational comparison of US cities and metropolitan areas, uh, a group of scholars have found that greater levels of social heterogeneity are linked to reduced spending on public goods either because such heterogeneity makes collective action less possible or less likely, or because there's less likely to be consensus around preferences for public goods, right? So we might see a breakdown of this consensus in, in, in Norway, something that we've been talking about right now. And it may not, it may not be that that consensus is entirely along um, racial or ethnic lines, but it may be along class lines, right? But this literature is really focused on sociocultural ethnic identity. Um, a distinct but topically related literature looks at the relationship between welfare, welfare provision and social diversity. So here the focus is not on public goods per se, but on the willingness of the larger population to support redistributive policies that benefit specific targeted populations. And, and you can think about SD welfare, targeted SD welfare programs uh, in, in this sense. So according to one set of arguments, higher levels of social diversity make welfare funding less likely. This argument has been used, for example, to explain the gap in welfare provision between the United States, a relatively more socially heterogeneous, popu heterogeneous population, and European countries with their relatively more homogeneous populations, historically at least. I think that's changed a lot um, since this literature you know, first emerged. Applied at the subnational level, the findings from these, from these literatures uh, would suggest two things that political jurisdictions that are more socially homogenous would demonstrate higher support for public goods, and states formed on the basis of a clearly defined subnational identity would be more robust welfare states. So this, this second um, sort of uh, 
the second um, hypothesis draws really heavily on the work of Prerna Singh. Some of you might know her work on subnational identity and welfare, and Kerala is her model case for that argument, right? She argues that uh, there was the development starting from the late 19th century of a robust sense of we-ness, as she calls it in the Carolyn context, and it, it is that robust subnational identity that privileges the production or the, and the, the, the um, uh, willingness of populations to support collective goods that in turn is what explains why Kerala is such an outlier with really high, high rates of literacy and uh, health outcomes. Okay. Um, so I've already told you a bit about uh, a bit about our four states. Uh, the Vasi populations are roughly comparable in these four states. They have roughly comparable socioeconomic profiles. Um, they, uh, uh, you know, they have fairly constrained state capacity, um, and yet what we find are really sharp, sharp variations in uh, in a set of empirical measures, right? And we use two in this. Um, in this essay, we first look at uh, Adivasi targeted welfare programs, and we look at data from 2000 to 2016. And then we look at the expansion of rights, and specifically the Forest Rights Act. Uh, I'll I'll speak really briefly about um, the the general welfare programs. It's less relevant here, um, but what what the that empirical analysis allows us to demonstrate is that there is variation across these four states, despite the fact that they are all somewhat similar, right? So we're comparing somewhat similar states, and yet we find a fairly sharp variation in their performance across these measures. And even more importantly for our intervention in this, this methodological discussion on subnationalism and um, you know, social identity and welfare, the, the state of Jharkhand, right, formed explicitly on the basis of a tribal homeland, uh, performs the worst. So here we've just, we've ranked each of these four states uh, according to a set of different welfare programs, and we've ranked them from one to four, with four being the worst performer of the mix and one being the best. It's kind of a crude way of uh, de you know, assembling a whole bunch of descriptive statistics uh, and just suggest, just, to, just to, to demonstrate the point that Jharkhand is uh, the worst performer of this group, right? Um, okay, so that, that was, first of all, we were surprised by that. You know, this was, it, it, it ran counter to the expectations that we had, actually. So we thought we would look more closely at the Forest Rights Act to try to understand what causal mechanisms might be producing this variation. Right, so just to give you a little bit of background on the Forest Rights Act. Um, okay. So if India's Adivasis have benefited the least from post-colonial development, arguably the most troubling aspect of their position within Indian society revol revolves around the insecurity of their property rights to forest lands and forest products. And the roots of this problem, of course, reach far back into the colonial period, when British authorities vested control and ownership over forests and forest resources in the state itself, something that you saw in lots of colonial contexts. Um, effectively making communities who lived in forests or reliant on forest products uh, trespassers on government land. Um, after a lot of activism by grassroots organizations focused on forest, resource, forest resources and forest management, the Forest Rights Act was passed in 2006 to rectify these historical injustices. So, you know, I think this, the preamble to the act is really interesting in making making really explicit the state's intention. And by the state here, I mean the state in New Delhi, right? So this act uh, is meant to recognize and vest the forest rights and occupation in forest lands and forest dwelling scheduled tribes and other traditional forest dwellers. Um, and it is a recognition that the forest rights uh, uh, on their ancestral lands and habitats were not adequately recognized in the consolidation of state forests in the colonial as well as in the Indi Indian independent, uh, as well as in independent India resulting in historical injustices to the forest dwelling scheduled tribes and other forest dwellers who are integral to the very sustainability and survival of the forest ecosystem, right? So the preamble to the act itself recognizes it's a mea culpa, although it wants to pin the, the, the seeds of this problem in the colonial period, as I think many post-colonial Indian policymakers um, like to do. Uh, but there's also a recognition that 
there is a relationship between these historical injustices to the property rights or the the way that forests were um, understood in relation to Adivasi communi communities and the ecological um, effects of this, right? Uh, the Forest Rights Act, um, you know, is just one of several different for uh, acts that governs forests now. Um, the 1927 Act that continues to um, be the, the the central piece of legislation that gives the forest the Ministry of Forests in India uh, its mandate still presumes forests op, you know are meant to be governed on the basis of economic principles, right? So forests should be governed in ways that uh, increase their potential value and output. So the Forest Rights Act is a real is a real challenge to a lot of prevailing sensibilities around governance of forests in India. Okay, so the Forest Rights Act allows forest dwelling individuals and communities, the majority of whom are Adivasi, uh, to file petitions with their state governments asking for recognition of their rights to forests and forest products. The law requires those submitting such claims to provide proof that their ancestors, up to three generations, used the forest, three generations in the past, um, used the forest for homes or livelihoods. Uh, from the time of its passage, critics have pointed out a number of the law's shortcomings, including that it privileges individual over community claims, and you really you see that in the data on the way that claims are managed, um, uh, and it thereby by privileging individual over community claims, it kind of subverts a lot of indigenous understandings of property as a community resource. Um, sorry, something's just come up on this. Um, the, second, the second main point of criticism is among the activists who are really uh, spearheading the effort to pass the Forest Rights Act, there was a real sense and a real understanding that it's the most progressive aspects of this act, of this policy, were diluted as it moved from the drafting table to the parliamentary floor. And the act that was passed is actually a much weaker version of the kinds of, um, uh, you know, the kinds of protections that the, 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 that the draft version had contained. Um, but notwithstanding these undoubted shortcomings, the FRA represents one of the most significant advances for India's Adivasi communities since independence. And that there's a kind of broad recognition, uh, recognition of. Moreover, in providing an avenue to, to devolve authority and ownership over India's forests back to the forest communities, the law is one of the clearest departures from the kinds of forest governance mechanisms or the logic of forest governance that was installed by the colonial state. So there's a really there's a complex set of um, procedures that are codified in the act uh, that clearly distinguish between levels of authority. There's a clear path, institutional pathway for how uh, claims should be filed. Um, you know which bodies are considered appellate bodies. How the state is the state government, that is the subnational government, is meant to play the role of collecting data, disseminating information, publicizing. Um, okay, so the, the the act in New Delhi is really clear about how it should be implemented at the state level, uh, and yet what you find when you look at implementation uh, is a lot of variation. So this data was taken from the annual report of 2016-17, so it includes the first six years of data after the act came into effect. It was passed in 2006, but I believe that um, we have the, the first set of claims filed, uh, not until maybe 2009. Um, okay, so there is a variation across these four states in the numbers of claims filed per Adivasi you know, uh, uh, as a percentage of the population of Adivasis in the state. There's a variation in the number of, the percentage of claims that are rejected. Uh, there is, um, there's, there's also variation that I don't think is given here in the, um, in the percentage of claims that are filed at, as individual claims and as communal claims, right? So there's var variation in multiple ways. Uh, uh, in how the FRA is implemented, just in these four states, just this sample of four. And Stephen, your your paper makes a great uh, you know contribution in just demonstrating the global variation in FRA implementation across all the states in India. Or I think the 17 that you include. Um, 
Okay, but even in these four that are more or less similar, right? So you could, you could argue that there is a difference in state capacity that, that accounts for this. And, and we've tried to control for those kinds of potential factors by looking at these, this sample of four. Um, so to try to understand uh, in a causal sense what might, be, uh, what might be explaining this variation, we did a set of qualitative, um, we, did, we did some qualitative research focused on the outlier state, which is Odessa. This is the outlier success story. Uh, and that qualitative research was meant to try to get at, as I said, this what might be explaining this in a causal way. Um, we conducted interviews with um, bureaucrats uh, in the Ministry of Tribal Affairs in Odessa, uh, bureaucrats retired and active in the Forest Department, um, bureaucrats in the Industries Department. We tried to canvas a range of government figures, and then we were able to do some interviews with uh, civil society organizations. Um, and what we heard in, especially those interviews with government actors, is that it was really the presence of civil society actors in Odessa that made the difference, right? In, uh, in, in sort of tracing the process by which the FRA was taken up in the state of Odessa, what we heard in all of these narratives that were tracking this process was the role of non-state actors, right? So this was not something that was rolled out by the state, but it was really something that was mediated in a, in a really meaningful way by civil society organizations. So I'll give, you, um, I'll give you a sense of the ways in which I think civil society actors played this role um, in implementing the FRA. Uh, and I kind of break it down into three, three separate domains in which they participated, right? Um, the first is they played a role in publicity and translation. Um, and this is for several different reasons, which I'll, I'll talk about it in a minute. Um, they played a role in community training and empowerment. Uh, and they played a role in sort of mediating some of the interbureaucratic conflict, right? They played a role in helping to coordinate across bureaucracies. Because as I said earlier, right, the FRA, when it, was, when it was brought into being, actually contradicted a lot of other laws that were in place in this sector. And so it produced a set of bureaucratic frictions or uh, uh, conflicts that had to, be, had to be overcome for this to be successfully implemented. And what we found through this field work in Odessa is that civil society actors played a role in, in helping to mediate. Um, Okay, so our research suggested that variation in FRA implementation was not due to the quality or, or effectiveness of state governments per se, but rather the presence of non-state civil society organizations that were, were able to work with the state. So there, there were these three specific ways um, that CSOs became important. Um, so first, the first, uh, publicity and translation. So after the FRA was enacted, um, in 2006, the law was published in the official government gazette in 2007, and the Ministry of Tribal Affairs issued the rules to implement the law in January 2008. And from that point onwards, CSOs were invited by the Ministry of Tribal Affairs in Odessa to play this multifaceted and increasingly active role in raising awareness about the FRA. Right, so first the network of civil society organizations became involved in advancing property rights for STs that had, sorry, that had been involved in advancing property rights for STs. So that is, there already was a network of CSOs active in the state. Uh, and they used, they, they mobilized this network of activists that existed not only in the provincial capital, Vubaneshwar, that's the capital city of Odessa, but they actually existed, this network was in place across districts within the state of Odessa, right? Um, and they began to use that, they activated that network to publicize the act. One CSO was really prominent in this, although it didn't act alone, and this was an organization called Vasundra. So briefly, Vasundra was formed because it becomes important in the story in Odessa. It was formed in the early 1990s by a group of students from the Indian Institute of Forest Management, um, who during field visits to forested areas in Odessa became aware that communities who rely on forests for livelihoods, many of whom are Adivasi, had developed sophisticated communal means to protect their forest lands, so something that Ostrom would not be surprised to hear. These joint forest management techniques were really distinct from the scientific management principles of the Indian Forest Department, particularly in the way they acknowledged human settlements as part of the forest ecology rather than a problem that had to be removed, which was kind of the modus operandi of the colonial era statutes that governed um, forests. Um, 
From the 1990s onwards, activists in Vasundara were single-mindedly focused on legalizing these communal practices by advancing the rights of forest-dwelling and forest-dependent communities. The alacrity and organizational capacity with which Odisha civil society organizations, including Vasundara, responded to the FRA became one of the key reasons that its implementation has been so much more successful there than elsewhere. Uh, the Odisha government's own scheduled caste and scheduled tribes research and training institute, which is a kind of para-statal quasi-governmental organization, worked closely with activist networks in the state to begin translating the act and its rules into various tribal languages and dialects. Right. So, the the you know the predominant language in the state of Odisha uh, 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 of Odisha is Odia, but it's not a language that's shared by all 36 probably now 40 million residents of the state, right? So tribal dialects and tribal languages, some of which have scripts and some of which don't, are still widely used. And this network of activists became uh, heavily involved in publicizing and translating the act into language that became accessible, that made it accessible. Um, and these translations were a key early effort that facilitated, facilitated the dissemination of knowledge of the FRA far more widely than would have been possible otherwise. A second initiative uh, that was convened jointly by the state government and CSOs took place in 2010, so just four years after that, this act was passed. Um, and this involved a workshop, kind of like this one, that brought young people from various tribal communities that had been part of activist networks to the provincial capital where they were kind of walked through the process of the FRA, right? The FRA uh, requires individuals to submit claims to gram panchayats or village councils. Those village co councils then adjudicate those claims and pass on the ones that they consider legitimate to higher level bodies, and ultimately they become, you know, they, they are collected at the state level, right? So that process of filling out forms, the, the bureaucratic processes involved in making a claim on the state even under a piece of legislation that is meant to protect and advance the rights of Adivasis is a complex one with lots of barriers to entry. So the work that this workshop did in training young people in particular from Adivasi communities to go back to their communities and districts and actually publicize the FRA, you know, this, as we heard repeatedly from bureaucrats that we spoke to, this was really key in making the FRA more accessible. Um, so participants were coached through the process of filling out the manifold forms. The Indian state is bureaucratic in the best sense. It is extremely, uh, extremely uh, paper intent labyrinth in its, you know, um, red tapism. Um, so it requires a certain savvy and skill. Uh, and this, you know, this process of actually training young people to do this. Um, enabled them to return and serve as the government liked to call them as ambassadors for the FRA. Uh, scholars who study the anthropology of the post-colonial state in South Asia, and these are people like Akhil Gupta or um, even Matthew Hall's work in Pakistan, have noted the barriers to access posed by this, the bureaucratic uh, labyrinth in India uh, and forms for precisely those citizens who are, sorry, the, bu the bureaucratic labyrinth of records and forms for precisely those citizens who are the putative beneficiaries of government programs, right? So this paper raj, as sometimes it's referred to, is a barrier to entry uh, that has to be overcome in an active way, right? Uh, it can't just be assumed. Um, educating individuals from tribal communities about the documentary world or the documentary practice then served as an important way to lower barriers to access. According to the state government bureaucrat most directly involved in the implementation and oversight of the FRA, it was this training event held in 2010 that was the sig significant cause of what he described as a quantum jump in FRA applications, fi like th the number of claims that were filed after 2010. Um, okay, the third, very briefly, a final role played by CSAs involved facilitating coordination across bureaucratic agencies. Uh, so historically, several different bureaucracies have laid claim to the management and protection of India's forests. While the state-level forest department is the official owner of the forests, the state-level revenue department controls land, including forest land. The tribal affairs department, by contrast, serves and represents the interests of tribal communities, the majority or a substantial proportion of which are reliant on forests. Um, the jurisdictional overlap of these agencies resulted in a kind of antagonistic relationship once the FRA came, uh, came, uh, was codified or enacted. Um, so 
the Tribal Affairs Department, working with CSOs, adopted a set of strategies to try to mitigate the inherent tension or conflict in FRA implementation by doing things like um, What are some good examples? Um, okay, so they hosted the Tribal Research Institute, which I mentioned is a kind of quasi-governmental body, working with CSOs, hosted a training session for officials of the Forest Department, functionaries from other state bureaucracies, and CSOs, right? They were all brought together. Uh, and when these various disparate groups came together, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of potential conflict was cleared. Uh, just by the ability to, to uh, you know, to communicate their interests across diverse groups. Um, second, and perhaps more importantly, um, some of the central government funding for Odessa's tribal sub, sub plan, so these targeted, S, targeted ST welfare programs, was apportioned for use by the district collector's office for FRA implementation. And with these funds, the collector's offices, the, these are the bureaucratic agencies at the district level, were instructed to hire retired revenue inspectors and other retired forest department officials to actually um, help with FRA implementation, right? So they kind of, one way to think of this is that they were bought off. Another way to think of it is that these kinds of uh, carrots have to be provided to overcome this um, bureaucratic friction. Um, so Odisha's success in FRA implementation contrasts really sharply with Jharkhand. And Jharkhand is not a place that we were able to do qualitative research on the ground. But by then there was already, because you know, we were not the only ones surprised that Jharkhand had such a poor record of implementation, uh, a, lot of, a lot of actors looking at F the FRA as it was being rolled out were surprised at how poorly FRA was faring in Jharkhand, the supposed tribal homeland, right? Um, and so we were able to access a lot of government the government's own reports on the FRA coming out of Jharkhand, as well as bilateral, multilateral agencies that were invested in trying to understand this. Uh, and DFID, the bilateral UK bilateral aid agency, uh, became a big actor in trying to understand why it is that Jharkhand was failing. And what these, these gray reports and published, in some cases published reports, revealed is that there was a not only was, were CSOs not invited to participate in the FRA implementation, there was an in, inbuilt antagonistic relationship between government agencies and CSOs in Jharkhand. And a lot of DFID efforts well, went to try to actually um, create incentives for cooperation between state and non-state actors to make the FRA more effective in, in Jharkhand. Um, So one of the things that came out in these reports is that government officials in Jharkhand blamed the lack of FRA implementation on the Maoist threat, right? The Naxalite threat, which I think comes up, Stephen, in, in your work as well. Um, but the committee that, had, that, that DFID had organized to try to investigate the FRA actually heard no complaints along these, uh, these lines, either from villagers or formal complaints from officials in the districts, right? So it was something that you heard in Ranchi in the capital city of Jharkhand to explain the lack of FRA implementation, but it's not something that you heard at the district level by villagers or even by administrators at the district level. So it, I, don't, I don't actually think that that explains it at all. Um, Jharkhand does have a poor state capacity, but so does Odisha. So does some of the others that have actually done a better job. So I actually do believe that this, the role of non-state actors is, is substantial and consequential in explaining something like the FRA. Where, how, am, how am I doing on time? Left? OK. Um, I think actually I'll, I'll leave more time for discussion and end with just a few uh, concluding thoughts that try to bring back the discussion to the one on accountability, right? So um, most transitions, and this is, some, this is a theme that has appeared in lots of different uh, papers throughout the last day and a half, is that most transitions of any kind, uh, and I think of the Forest Rights Act as a transition in the logic of forest governance, right? Um, are the result of the intersecting work of state and non-state actors, right? There's a co-production. Um, and that's how we have to understand the energy transition. That's how we have to understand the object of the study. 
Um, and I think hopefully this work on, on the Forest Rights Act has demonstrated that CS civil society organizations, particularly in, in, in a context like India, will play, will, will be a cru crucial mechanism of accountability. So the problem in, in India, uh, and actually this echoes something that Christian said yesterday, right? It's, the problem is not, is not a, a lack of laws. India has a surfeit of laws. The problem is that the state is not held to account to implement those laws. And who is gonna hold the state accountable is, 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 the, is the question, right? And so what I'm suggesting is that um, it's, not, it's, not the, it's not laws that are needed, it's, uh, it, it, it's holding the state accountable to implement the laws that it's passed. And CSOs play the role of holding the state accountable. Um, and then I think that you know, the other last point that I wanna end with is that accountability analysis has to attend to the fragmented and contradictory nature of the state, which I suggested is definitely operative in the case of forest, forest management in India, but I think in all contexts, um, but also of the public, right, of society, and that's something that's come up repeatedly in, in this discussion. So I have a, you know, a lot more detail on the FRA, but I think, I think I'll stop and, and instead suggest that we have a more general discussion. To come up, I just wanted to say that there has been, for me, it's been great fun. Um, Sunila had, you know, she was hosting me in Seattle last semester, and I, I pitched this idea of uh, of the book, and and she, and, and there are a lot of overlaps. I've I worked on Jharkhand before. I was yeah. moving into energy, and uh, you helped me find my feet in there, and uh, and then I, she she didn't see herself in the book, and yet was gracious enough to come and. I think make a really useful contribution that brings out things that I don't think necessarily come out when one looks at energy transitions in as something that's in and off the energy sector. And so to me, that was always going to be valuable and it was really fun to see you try it out. But I'll, uh, having said that, I'll pass on to people who have things to. Yeah, thank you very much. It's again, really neat to hear the trajectory of your work and thinking of all of us, how we all go in slightly different paths, but we kind of end up in similar places. So I'm really curious about this last thing you said about holding the state accountable. Because something I've been thinking a lot about with critical environmental justice is frequently it's the state that's actually the one that's enabled these historical unevenness. And not just the state in India, but the state elsewhere. And so could you problematize a bit the sense that the state is the entity that they should be seeking accountability or potentially justice from. Because some of the critical environmental justice literature argues that we should be looking for alternatives, not necessarily for accountability, but for pathways for true justice and sustainability that are external to the state structures that have perpetuated injustice, unevenness historically. And so I'd just be curious to get your take on that because it's something that I think in the Indian context, it's hard to imagine not working within that state context um, because the state is so ever present and so kind of a much a part of everyday citizens' lives. Um, but I'd be curious to get your thoughts on that and kind of problematize that a little bit. Well, so my initial reaction is actually um, to, to to, to echo what you ended with, right? Which is that in the Indian context, it's really hard to imagine not engaging with the state. And so things like the Right to Information Act have actually been hugely in, in, uh, important in the last 10 years in holding the state to account. Um, it's, it, you know, it's, it, it's impossible to imagine, um, it, for me, impossible to imagine achieving more just outcomes that don't go through the state in some way in the Indian context. Um, even when that state is extremely problematic. Yeah. Right. Um, thank you very much. It's super interesting. It raises a whole bunch of questions, but I'll try to stick with um, just one or two. Um, you said something about uh, with this new um, 
Forestry Act, both individuals and communities could apply for uh, land rights. <coughs> and I'm, I'm a little bit curious to see, so if you're an individual, to whom are you then beholden for your land rights, if you have your individual land rights? And if the community applies for land rights, does it have to fulfill certain criteria to be a community? And how's the accountability working inside that community then? Because um, it, it, the question doesn't disappear just because you, you empower a community or you, you give rights and recognitions to a community. The same questions just, uh, they're just reiterated in a slightly different context, but they're basically the same questions. Yeah. Um, that's a great question, and I certainly, um, I, I don't think that it's, it's sufficient to romanticize the notion of community anything, and, and communities are shot through with hierarchies of all kinds. Um, but there, what has been seen in the, Indian, in the FRA implementation is higher rates of rejection of claims that are community-based claims uh, than individual property rights claims. So... Um, it's also the case that a proposed amendment to this law uh, that was just, it was just proposed a few months back in March of this year and it's in a secretive way, uh, it's sort of distributed to, at the district level, at the state level, uh, s further weakens the ability of the, of, the, of the law to enable community-based claims. Um, so they do see community-based claims as a threat, I think. The, the, you know, the state sees community-based claims as a threat. Um, in terms of the internal, like the mechanics of how a community claim is made, I actually can't, I, I can't speak to that right now. Um, but it would be similar to the way the individual claim is made, which is that they have to demonstrate several generations. Like the, bar the barriers of proof are higher because you'd have to demonstrate a certain community has historically resided on that, on that land for three generations past. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, on that last point, uh, our work uh, in Tamil Nadu one of the interesting things is that the um, community claims, uh, the communities have to demonstrate some competence for forest monitoring, for example, anti-poaching and forest fire management capability to the forest department. And the forest department has some duty to uh, make sure that they have some capability because in theory they'll be the stewards ecologically. Right. Um, and the NGO I'm working with is uh, training young people, they call them barefoot ecologists, and they're actually actively training them to try to build up this competence to satisfy this requirement, and it's quite interesting. So, uh, terrific talk, because of my own personal interest, but also because of the book, and I really do encourage Sid, who's quite gifted at arm twisting, to encourage you to participate. I'm I aware think of that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean it in only the best way. Um, that this uh, question of civil society organizations uh, Holding the state accountable is very exciting and really important, and uh, I guess maybe uh, governance isn't dead. I would ask you to, if you could, <laughs> offer some specific examples or uh, categories of exactly how do they do this? What exactly is the practice that enables an NGO on the ground to hold a bureaucrat accountable? That's one question. Yeah, um, good. The other ones, um, this first bullet point, um, Jasanoff co-production, um, I understand that to be a um, collaborative joint knowledge production. And um, I'm, uh, I'm strictly non-conflict averse. And I think that one of the uh, like intersecting work um, can take the form of like a productive tension. So it's not co-production in my mind. So I'd ask you to perhaps explain or to open that back up. And, and I think we can have um, collaborative work between state and non-state, but we can also have production tensions mm -hmm. and oversight. That'll be the last one. And last comment. When, when you gave me a hard time about this kind of pat and easy answer about yeah, deliberative yeah. democracy, which yeah. I appreciate, I was convinced you were going to go to rights-based development as an alternative. And now you have, but you didn't make that connection. So do you see rights-based as an important alternative. We offer technocracy, we offer democracy, and we have rights-based. But I think we see in your empirical work that the rights-based is quite messy, and this deliberative, yeah. political, variable, non-deterministic uh, outcomes, I think it came up in Christian's work on Indonesia as well, it's not so easy. Oh, rights-based, they'll just pass a law. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, okay, those are great, great comments. Um, 
So let me start with the last <laughs> observation. So this, the, the, the government that was in power before the current government in India is the, it was a, a Congress government that was in power for 10 years, and they, they will probably be known by history as the rights government, right? So they're a right to uh, education, a right to food, the Forest Rights Act, the right to information. They all were, uh, you know, came into existence in that last um, government. And, you know, those things mean nothing uh, if the state is not forced to, 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 to implement them. Um, and it is a, it is a, a contingent, messy, contradictory process in which there's backsliding. Um, it, it, yeah, but in the Indian context, it, it, has, it has been um, a consequential move forward, I think, in general, right? With all of the contingencies and regression uh, as, a part of this, as a part of what I'm saying. Um, but I, I do think it's become really important in the Indian context. Um, but what you see in the case of the, you know, the, to just take the Forest Rights Act, take the right to education. I mean, fine, you have a right to education, but if your schools aren't staffed by teachers, you know, the, the existence of the school building is meaningless. Um, so finding mechanisms to hold the state to account for the rights that it has promised uh, is, the, I think, the, 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 messy, the, messy, the messy work of development in the Indian context. Um, okay, so how does an NGO hold a bureaucrat to account? That's a great question. Um, you know, everything from, uh, you know, uh, sort of classic tactics of contentious politics in the Indian context, like circling the bureaucratic uh, office and, uh, you, know, you know, taking to the streets, as it were. But in the, in the case of the Forest Rights Act, what re was really clear is not just in the, that, that, the civil society actors existed in the, Odisha, the context of Odisha. It's that they had already a relationship with the, with the state. So there was a, a kind of willingness on the part of the state to recognize that these actors would become important in the implementation of this act. And in Jharkhand, you know, it's what, I, what, 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 the, what this, um, this research on the state has suggested is that there was an antagonism. Um, uh, between these actors. And I don't know if some of you are familiar with the work of Alpa Shah. Um, and in, in a beautiful book uh, called in the, in the Shadow of the State, she kind of characterizes Jharkhand's indigenous politics as being really bifurcated, right? There were the Ranchi activists, the Ranchi, the, provin the activists based in the provincial capital who had a certain understanding of what indigenous <laughs> rights meant. And then there was the, you know, the various Adivasi communities throughout the state whose interests were not maybe being served by uh, the, the activists in Ranchi. So there's a kind of uh, disconnect within the state of Jharkhand among Adivasi communities that, is, that gets kind of re replayed uh, in, in the specific case that I'm looking at. And Siddharth, this is something that you could speak to too. Um, okay, so the last, the last point that you made was about agonism, uh, productive conflict emerging out of uh, something productive emerging out of conflict. And that's like kind of that, you know, that theory of democracy that Chantal Mouffe proposes, right? That um, democracies, uh, democracies function because of this agonism, this antagonism among actors, but it's productive only when that conflict um, rests on a shared set of norms, right? And I think what, I don't know if I've made that clear, but what's terrifying about this moment, when I was reading Move recently, I, what I was realizing is that both Trump in the US, but also Modi in different ways, the Prime Minister of India, have kind of subverted the expectation of what our shared set of norms are. And it's not clear now that democracy is producing anything like a productive, the kind of productive conflict that Move suggests is how we should think about conflict in democracy because I don't think we're all operating in the shared set of norms, and this is something that we were talking about upstairs just now before lunch, uh, during lunch. Yeah, thanks. Um, perhaps an ignorant question, but um, who holds the uh, NGOs to account? Um, yeah, yeah. And then, so why does the government engage with the NGOs and not the citizens? It, it, I don't know if Directly, that's yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so, so this, why this. their intermediary role? Can you just take a bunch? Sure. 
Anybody else? I have a question and a comment. Um, the, I'll start with the comment, and I'm really happy you put this last point up here. I think I've been thinking of polycentric uh, governance very much in, as part of your talk, and I think we talk about overlapping domains of authority and some amount of contestation issues of trust, which, just, which you just brought up, um, and legitimacy. But the contradictory, the fragmented nature here, to me, speaks to some of the things Christian brought up in terms of state, non-state, and these binaries that are essentially false binaries because they don't obtain except as results rather than empirics. And um, I, I have a chapter out last week on, uh, on Jharkhand where one of the cases that I look on, so only took three and a half years to come out there. Um, <laughs> but um, it actually goes into the claim making over land under the FRA by uh, a bunch of people who had uh, founded a village in the forest and tried for many years, and to them the state I would question what, what constituted the state because they understood that they had to file these claims with the council and so on, but they didn't have a council. They had right. to file it so that it would go through into the bureaucracy and be taken up at a point where it could be considered. So they paid somebody who said that they understood the process, 500 rupees each household, which is a lot of money in that context. And that didn't work, so they paid 1,000 each another time. And the third time when they paid 500 each. And nothing ever came of it, it's yeah. not even cer certain that those claims were filed by anyone ever. To me, if that was an NGO, or if that were, you know, DFID trying to bring CSOs into collaborating with the state, I, I would say that that's not the same for all CSOs, that's not, it's not the same for all funding agencies, they come with their own set of things that they want to achieve, and EFAD has uh, played a big role in, in Jharkhand in particular, also elsewhere, so, so to me, even that question of whether CSOs play a certain role in, in accountability just as mechanisms, I think those mechanisms are quite differentiated. And I think explicating, it, it comes out, but I think actually focusing on that would add something. The other point is a question, and that links to what Patrick and I in a piece that's coming out this summer, uh, I think we even have the phrase in there, um, it's, it's about it's, the empire strikes back. And you mentioned this, the FRA is something that's being peeled right back. back. It's not incidental yeah. with the kind of government that we've seen in India. Yeah. It's a precursor to what's been happening in the US. And, and where do you see that going? I mean, one thing is what CSOs can do, but they're in a quite limited wiggle room themselves with forces that are larger and that I would say, in some sense, are the state, not so much experientially for the other Vasis, the communities, and yeah. the indi individuals, but in a way that seems to actually decimate things like the FRA and the Right to Information Act of any teeth they might have. Yeah, um, yeah, and in fact, so, so the FRA was passed, and it was passed by a group of, you know, CSOs played a really big role in, in the passage of the FRA almost as soon as it came into effect, it's been criticized, right, by, by activists, by academics. I think the fact of it being rolled back is a sign of how consequential it was. Like, there's a lot to criticize about it, and there was a lot to, to, to want to protect in it. And I think, you know, the, these, these, these new set of proposed amendments that roll it back will kind of hopefully galvanize uh, an effort to, to, to keep some of what was the best in it in place recognizing all of its shortcomings, right? You know, I don't think that any of these processes, I, I, don't, I don't even think that in the end we're moving to a better place, right? It's, I, I don't think that that, that a teleological notion of progress is one that I, you know, that I see in history. Uh, I think different people are left out in different historical junctures. Uh, there's no reason to believe that we're, it's, it's going to get better. But I, I think it's also... It's also, um, okay, that was pessimistic. But I, <laughs> but, but I think recognizing the contingency, right? So yes, this is, this is a particularly fraught, terrible moment. But it, it's not necessarily going to keep going down that path either, right? Um, all right, that was an ineloquent way of saying it. Um, who holds the NGOs to account? That's a great question. And in the South Asian context, in a lot of the global South, the fear for many, many decades and still is the, you know, the NGOs kind of displacing the authority of the state in many ways. I think that they're, it's, it's, I think that, that both 
both extremes are misplaced, right? So both thinking that the state can solve everything and also thinking that NGOs can solve everything is, but neither is, is helpful. But actually thinking about how and under what conditions certain kinds of CSOs that maybe do advance rights of marginalized communities come to have a consequential role in states is, is maybe the more limited empirical question we could ask. You know, why is it that an organization like Vasundara comes to exist in Odessa and becomes important, comes to be taken seriously by ministries of tribal affairs uh, is, is, a, is, is the more limited question we could ask. Um, yeah. Thank you. Shall we have a round of applause for Sunila?